its birthday this year. It's 150 <coughs> years old, a state, but still it's much older as an idea and uh, as a word also. Uh, but uh, the book starts with um, the unification of Italy in uh, on the 17th of March in 1861, the king of uh, Piemont Sardegna, Vittorio Emanuele II, he was made king or proclaimed king of the new state of, in, of Italy. And this was uh, a nation building which other states had already had. For instance, France uh, was uh, consolidated much earlier at the end of the Middle Ages. So, Italy is a young state, um, and it was born as a state in the Piedmont, Piemonte, in this region in the north, north of Italy, the, with Torino as, um, as the first capital. The second capital was Florence, and the third one was Rome. And Rome was a small place when it was made capital of Italy. And all the buildings we now know from the Stazione Termini and all these um, uh, quarters of Rome around the Stazione Termini were built for the huge mass of, um, uh, of people who came there to work at the, at the government of Italy, at the ministries of the newly born state. Right, so this <coughs> is um, a bit... Uh, an interesting moment that right at, at the 150th birthday of the state of Italy, this book comes out. Um, but it doesn't start with the politics, it starts again with a song. It's a song by Gian Maria Testa, and it's called Polvere di Gesso, and uh, so uh, plaster powder. and. It's also an image that stands at the beginning of the book. Uh, Testa, he tells in the song about how he puts plaster powder on the floor of his house every morning to um, conserve the traces of the people that enter the house during the day. So it's traces of people that we are looking for and it's, it's sort of friends that we find if we go into the biographies and into the stories they tell us. Um, yeah, it's also interesting that Gian Maria Testa, for example, is not so famous in Italy, but he's very famous in Germany and in Austria. So these are phenomenons, cultural phenomenons that are all, I have also witnessed in the, during <coughs> the work um, for this book. Yeah, I'm also talking about wine in the book <laughs> uh, and about food. Um, maybe I should mention that. Um, usually it's an osteria that's mentioned in, um, in a text, but I have one chapter uh, in which I tell about a family of uh, winemakers in Piemonte and about their family story and how it's related to the product. So the, I think this is also interesting how they interact with the wine they are growing and the wine they are um, selling on the international market. And the other story about food is also very political in a way. Um, it's called um, slow food. Uh, it's about the slow food movement, and maybe you know that also, uh, because this is an international NGO uh, which is working all over the place, it's uh, making projects in India, um, and it was born around a table with a piatto di, di una pasta regionale, with a um, plate of pasta, of regional pasta, uh, where Carlo Petrini, the founder of Slow Food, uh, he would say, well, McDonald's has opened uh, near the Piazza di Spagna, near the Spanish steps in Rome, so we have to do something to uh, um, emphasize our Italian way of eating, which is not McDonald's. And um, uh, my partner 
who has now joined our talk here, and I, we were walking through Rome, through Trastevere, uh, some time ago, and somebody asked another person, um, where's the McDonald's? And uh, this person, a Roman, would say, McDonald's, pas kifo, McDonald's is gross. Uh, and so this tells a lot, of course, um, about um, Italianità again, about this uh, making of, of um, national identities. And so I have um, told the story about Slow Food Italia, how it was founded and how they work. And, and they say that today the work of farmers and of uh, people who produce food should be appreciated a lot more than the work of architects, lawyers, or bankers. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a political view which uh, I think is, is um, worth to, to think about. And, and it's also a utopian vision of life which has uh, its place in this um, puzzle or network of Bella Arcadia. And Bella Arcadia is in total 24 chapters and it ends, it ends in uh, Venice, and I think that's also quite um, telling because Venice um, is um, a city that, li that lives from its history, and uh, there's maybe no other city that uh, um, makes you fall back into history or into earlier ages um, like Venice. And I have chosen one of my favorite travelers in Italy as a witness in Venice. It's uh, a British traveler, of course. I um, wrote about him in my um, thesis, these British travelers in Italy in the 19th century. It's um, Lord Byron. And he, um, he was a great traveler, and he was famous, and uh, there's a very famous quotation of Byron's, it says, I woke up one morning and found myself famous. Uh, and he found himself famous because he had written a travel story. It's called, uh, an, um, um, a work of poetry, and it's called, um, Child Harold's Pilgrimage, and it's a travel story about the east of, of, of uh, well, the Near East, where Greek, uh, Greece, Albania, and so on, about Byron's travels there, and he imagines these, this um, uh, um, landscapes, but he also tells a lot about people. It's always people who are in the center of Lord Byron's um, um, art and poetry. Um, right, and so it's, he became famous in London with this story about traveling, but he became an exile himself. He had to leave London out of different reasons, which I also tell in the book. And what did he do? He went to Italy. And his choice, Venice, was a very interesting choice at the time because there were no, not a lot um, internationals living in Venice, different from today. Um, it was they were not attracted by Venice, and this is maybe also something which is uh, which goes back to politics. <laughs> at the time, Venice was um, uh, after the end of its glory. So the Republic of Venice, La Serenissima Repubblica di Venezia has ceased to exist and um, it was a state of, um, well, changing or, or, or uncertainty also. And it was the Austrians who were uh, uh, trying to ha have their hands on, on the region there. And interesting enough, um, Byron was fighting against the Austrians. He would uh, support the Carbonari, the um, people who, who um, secretly
famously fought against the Austrians in in uh, in Venice. Um, right. So uh, we see Venice at the end of this book uh, through Lord Byron's eyes, and uh, we tell his story. And there's also another story in Venice, which is the the final one. Um, right, and this was what I wanted to give you. I wanted to give you an idea about what this book is about. And, and you've heard a lot of um, stories, and all these stories uh, came out of these travels, which I did um, as a journalist, as a traveler. And tomorrow I'm going to Rome, and <laughs> if you want to ask me something, um, I would at this point thank you a lot for your um, coming here and for listening to my um, stories and maybe Dr. Rowe wants to say something, well, maybe you. you want to ask something. Thank you, Mr. Noble, we will do questions. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Quickly, quickly, because it quickly. ends like in two weeks. It ends like it ends yeah. in two weeks, and it's extremely important to understand. So you can see Catherine Corona, a real historical person who's read and reread and reinterpreted over time, and down in the studio, which formerly was in our neighborhood, uh, this great painting was created. The second thing is, is Pier Paolo Pasolini. Pier Paolo Pasolini, and this this is even more uh, directly uh, connected in a way uh, to the Diplomatic Academy. He was in fact born. City of Bologna. His father was a, a general in the Carabinieri, Carabinieri kind of military uh, 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 police. Um, and the house where he was born is still a police station of the Carabinieri. And our chair of economics, Professor Werner Neudeck, uh, spent some time in Bologna and he lived uh, in the building next door. This was when, and I was there too in the, in the same city at the time. And of course, this was our youth, and we were very rowdy. Uh, and since we often got into trouble uh, ourselves and with the students in various parties, uh, uh, when the open windows made too much noise uh, facing the Carabinieri barracks uh, where Pier Paolo Masolini was born, and they would come over uh, and straighten us out. Uh, so again, I think it's this question of the, the immense importance in history of place, of location, and it's to see how these things pass through time. They live in, uh, they live in our collective imagination uh, in the Arcadia. Now, I think we have, uh, we have time for some questions, and they can be, I think, about it, anything. But I might start off with some two of them uh, that came uh, to my mind immediately. One is a kind of practical thing. How does this work? How do you actually make a radio show? How do you turn a story? What, 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 does, what does one hear? Uh, do you go down with the 
tape recorder? Um, my, let me define my second question, okay. I'll sit down. And then you can field okay. your own questions, I think. My second question was, your, your, the content, the subjects here, uh, uh, this is about Italy, but your listeners, the people who are listening to the radio, are here in Austria. How did this work out? What, what was the connection between uh, the stories about Italy and the listening public, which is uh, Austria? Mm -hmm. How do you make a radio program? Well, uh, first of all, it's um, the topic. The topic is everything. You have to think about what interests me and does it interest other people as well. And if you have this topic, as I have these 24 topics of the book, um, you ask yourself who can say something about it. Uh, and it must be locals or people who live in these places, so uh, to organize a trip there, and, and then it, you have to balance um, the interviews. Uh, maybe the best thing is to um, make fixed appointments with people, but you have also have to have time to make things happen or to let things happen and to, to have coincidence have its place. Um, yeah, and how did I do it technically? Um, working for the radio is um, a bit uh, harder than working for print, uh, which I know from many press trips where colleagues from print uh, were with us on these travels. As a radio journalist, you have also have you have always ha have to have um, good recorded material, and when you are traveling and you are maybe on a place in an open square, it's hard to get this. But so this is a technical program uh, problem, <laughs> and um, while I've been working for the Austrian Broadcasting Station techniques have changed a lot and developed a lot. When I started, when I went to Aslo in 2003, I, I went with a microphone and a cable and a duct recorder, digital, digital um, tapes were that. And the recorder was like a, a, a newborn baby. You had always uh, to watch it and, and it was so... Um, um, Unpractical to work with it because uh, the recordings uh, went bad if you if you just moved it and and then the the big microphone the heavy recorder and the cable uh, but right now I'm working with another digital um, recording recorder and it's with um, SD cards so digital cards which you maybe know from your photo. Uh, and yeah, so it, it has become a lot better, but still it's always hard to get um, recordings without interference, without uh, too much noise and so on. And then you get, you have to take people for the interview into quiet places and, and they have to take their time. And for these kinds of features, it's, it's feature, it's radio documentary, it's not, uh, like day-to-day uh, -day journalism. Um, for these kind of features, you have to make interviews that last one hour. So you have to talk to people and you have to, to make them develop their topics. And, and then you use only some sentence of the whole thing. But this is the essence and this makes um, a good feature. So that's the most important thing, the, the research and, and the interviews. Yeah, and I, I'm lucky that I speak Italian because, um, yeah, you, can, you find another uh, context to people if, you, if they see that you try or you make an effort to talk their language. Um, you know, and then you come back with all this material and then you make, um, 
a choice, the, the choice is hard. You have to find your focus and, and yeah, this is a lot, it's a very important part of the word. You just can't write it down like um, a report, first happened that and then I saw him and then her, but you have to find the focus of your story and your story takes you with it. Right, and then uh, what do you do? Yeah, you make a manuscript, and with this manuscript, um, well, you have it double checked by the producer of the program. In this case, I want to mention her. It's Ursula Burkert. She's a fabulous radio uh, journalist, and I'm very happy that I learned all these things from her. And she wrote also the preface of the book. <laughs> Uh, you know, and 